Um, so this is an open air webinar um, and I will explain the requirements of the open access uh, stipulation of um, the European Commission in Horizon 2020. So just to uh, set the scene a little bit, open access to publication is part of a wider movement called open science. And the aim of open science is to make science more transparent and also more accessible to more people. So it also includes things like open education or open source or citizen science and also open data. I'll talk about open data in the presentation after this presentation or about open access. So if you have questions on open data, uh, I would like to ask you to wait a little bit on those uh, since we will um, certainly be telling you more about it. But open access to research publication is an important topic uh, in, in Europe and in, in the world. Um, and the European Commission uh, tried to make the publications of their funded project openly available um, to optimize the impacts of publicly funded scientific research. The idea is that um, publicly funded research should be available for, for everybody and that it should be uh, available fast and, and very broad so that there is a greater transparency and faster progress in science. Um, so uh, in order to, to reach that aim, all beneficiaries from funding from the Rio, uh, European Commission are asked to deposit a peer-reviewed publication um, in a repository to ensure open access. So in the grant agreement that kind of sounds like this, uh, you should ensure open access as soon as possible and the latest on publication um, through a machine readable electronic copy of the published version or final peer reviewed manuscript in a repository for scientific publication together with bibliographic metadata. So this is a, a whole sentence, uh, sounds quite complicated, um, but I'll try to give um, every aspect of this complicated sentence uh, some more explanation and explain how you can um, comply with the open access policy of the European Commission. So first of all, um, some confusion. Uh, there's often some confusion about open access um, and that the only possibility of making an article openly available is through an open access journal. And actually, there, there are two ways to make um, an article openly available. You can still choose whatever journal you want. So you do not have to choose an open access journal. Of course, you can. But you can also um, just go for a subscription-based journal, the traditional journals where libraries pay, pay for a subscription. If you go for a subscription-based journal, then how do you make your publication open access? Well, you can deposit it in a repository and provide access that way. A repository is a kind of archive for articles that um, also provides services um, so that your article is sustainably uh, archived and available um, to the world. However, if you publish in an open access journal, you should also deposit in a repository and provide access. That way, uh, even if something happened to the open access journal, your uh, publication will still be sustainably archived. And of course, you have the services of a repository that will make your um, article widely available. You should so no matter which uh, a journal you choose, a subscription-based journal or an open access journal, you should always deposit a version in a repository and add information such as your grant ID number of the acronym of your um, project and the funder, publication date, possible embargoes. That way your article can be picked up by Google, for example, or by open air. So how do you know uh, which to choose? Um, um, subscription-based journal and then self-archive in a repository or an open access journal and self-archive in a repository. Well, both have their pros and cons. Um, if you choose for a subscription-based, you can choose any subscription-based journal. There are no fees for authors. Of course, the library pays for the subscriptions. 
but cons are that there is always a possibility that your publisher uh, poses an embargo period on the time in which you can make your article open access. For example, they can say, you have to wait six months before you have, can provide open access to a repository. If you go for an open access journal, of course, you have direct open access. It will be published online immediately. And sometimes you can retain your copyright. So there are no limits on what you can do to your own article or with your own article. Cons is because open access journals do not have these uh, subscriptions from libraries. Uh, some have adapted a business model where they ask the author of the um, article to pay costs for the journal. These costs are called APCs, article processes uh, charges, so they might be cost for you as researchers. This is not always the case. There are a lot of open access journals who do not charge art, uh, authors. Uh, there are various business models. Uh, some work with library consortium and such, but just so you know, it is a possibility. Um, so let's start maybe with uh, talking a little bit more about open access journals. So maybe you don't know really, okay, where can I find an open access journal in my domain? Well, there is a directory of open access journals, which um, allows, uh, has a list with high quality open access journals and also gives them more information about those journals. And you can look on a subject level. Uh, so I put a link there to the directory of open access journals. The slides will be shared, uh, so you will be able to follow all the links. It also gives information about these article processes charges. About these article processes charges, um, are they supported uh, by, your, by your grant? Yes, so both open access journal and um, what we call hybrid journals, which are just subscription-based journals that offer the possibility of making an individual article open access are um, possible to uh, uh, get in uh, to um, get the cost covered by your grant. Of course, the hybrid journal, it's a, a, a bit of a system that uh, we as libraries don't like to see because we as library pay for the subscription and then you pay for one article to make it openly available. That's paying double, which is very smart of the journals, but not so good on your budget. Keep in mind that uh, costs are eligible for reimbursement during the duration of your project. So if you want to publish after the duration of your project, um, costs are not eligible anymore. So keep that in mind. So how to budget? Um, well, a simple um, calculation, you could take an average APC and multiply it times the number of publications you're planning to, um, to publish, and then take that number and put it as a dissemination cost. But APCs vary widely and it's, it's often hard to track uh, what the APC uh, might be of what the average APC might be. You can look up a specific journals if you already know where you uh, want to publish or um, look at some of the journals you want to publish. You can ask also your librarian if they have information or you can consult the publisher website or you can base, base your calculations on average APCs. As I said, they vary widely, but there has been some studies done. I listed a couple. I think the average is about 1,600, but it, it varies widely and it's, it depends um, on the discipline very often. And also hybrid journals, so these journals that has just a subscription, but you can make one uh, article open access are often more expensive. You can also find information on APCs on the Open APC projects, which try to um, make this whole system a, more, a bit more transparent and they um, gather all this information on APCs, different journals, and so on. So, as I said, cost can be reimbursed in Horizon 2020 projects, and currently there's no price cap for APCs. Some issues to consider. Um, with open access journals, especially APC-based open access journals. So again, not all open access journals are APC-based. That um, if you want to publish all your um, articles in um, open access journals with APC, the cost might be a bit steep. 
So you can mix um, depositing articles in an archive or a repository and publishing in an open access journal. And also, since there's money involved, there are always some cowboys on the market. That's also true for open access journals. There have been some new publisher and journals who are not so strict on peer review. Um, so I would recommend to always consult uh, doaj.org or look at the, the website of the publisher. Most of the time, it's very easy to spot whether a publisher is credible or not. You can look at the uh, peer review uh, at the editing board of the journal. So what about the second vote or um, thing you have to do anyway, uh, namely depositing your article in an open access repository. So how do you go about that? Well, first of all, you have to find a repository, of course. Most research institutions or universities have an institutional repository, so it's always a good idea to look at your institutions, but there are also disciplinary uh, repositories. Think about PubMed Central, for example, there are also uh, repositories who accept um, publication from all institutions and all disciplines. Uh, so if you are not, um, uh, do not find a, a disciplinary repository, you can also go for, for example, Zenodo, which is an EC co-founded and multidisciplinary free repositories, repository um, that you can use for publication or data or even images or posters if you want to. I also listed some directories for open access repositories. So if you're not sure and you're looking for a disciplinary repository, you can check out those links. The last one, explore.openair.eu, um, will give you an overview of repositories which are linked to Openair. So Openair is not a repository, but they gather information from other repositories. Pedro will tell you more about that. What to deposit? It should be a peer-reviewed version. So either the final peer-reviewed manuscript or the publisher version, and you should add some metadata. So this information about your project and publication date, things like that. Um, so the requirements for open access publication apply to all kinds of publications. Um, you can also upload what they call gray uh, publications, but the emphasis is on peer-reviewed journal articles. Um, so definitely all your peer-reviewed uh, journal articles should be in a repository openly available. When to deposit as soon as possible and at the latest on publication. So I sometimes uh, get the question, okay, there's an embargo on my article, should I wait? to put it in a repository? No, you can just put it in a repository and most repository allow you to fill out an embargo um, until it becomes open access so then you don't have to worry about it anymore. So when to provide open access? If your publisher allows it or you publish in an open access journal, you can provide immediately open access or after an in embargo period if your publisher has something like that at most six months for the STEM scientist and 12 months for publications in social science and humanities is allowed. If your publisher does not allow um, or has an embargo period that is longer than the allowed embargoes, namely six months for STEM and 12 for um, social science, uh, the EC has a model amendment to publishing agreement. So you can ask your publisher to uh, sign this agreement. You can explain, okay, I'm part of a European project and I should make my publication openly available. Can you please make an exception? Um, and then you have this form that you can fill out, which is, um, uh, will allow you to uh, have a short embargo. It's always good to check the publisher policies um, even before you publish. So you know um, what, what the copyright policies is and the self-archiving permission of your publisher. Uh, the two um, things that, that uh, publishers sometimes uh, restrict you on is uh, first the embargo period. So they can say, okay, you have to wait six months before you make it open access or even more and the version that you can put in a repository. So those are the two things uh, you should pay attention to. 
Share by Romeo is a website that gives an overview of all publisher policies. And you can check the, what you are allowed to, to put in a repository and also if some uh, embargoes may apply uh, in case of this um, publisher. So the green and the blue ones are okay because they're, then you're allowed to, to archive a peer-reviewed version. So this is the, the version that the European Commission asks you to put in a repository. The yellow and the white are not peer-reviewed. Um, so uh, those are not uh, within the uh, frame of the European Commission's policy. And then the embargo periods, which you can check if they are in the limits that the EC allows or asks for. So in short, the researcher decides where to publish. So this is important to remember. Um, you can choose for an open access journal, but you also can choose for a subscription-based journal. In both cases, you should self-archive in a repository. It will make your article uh, available on a sustainable way. It will uh, add a persistent identifier, a handler, something that will uh, make your publication available for a long time and openly available. Always make sure to check the publisher policies on what you can archive and if an embargo um, is set by the publisher. If you publish in an open access journal, be sure to check if there are any um, uh, costs uh, attached to it and you can make your publication immediately open access uh, to the journal and to a repository. In case of self-archiving in a repository, there might be a delay due to an embargo or you might be allowed to immediately put it openly available. So this is really short um, how this works. Um, I shortly wanted to say something on Plan S. So Plan S, maybe you heard about it, maybe you didn't, is um, a plan launched by uh, Science Europe, so not by the European Commission, so don't want to um, confuse people, so it's not a plan of the European Commission, but by Science Europe, but it's, it's about um, accelerating the, the whole open access process. So they, they're like, okay, we have a lot of open access publication now, but it's still not 100% and why is it not happening? So the idea is that, um, so there was an update two, two weeks ago of this plan, that by uh, 2021, uh, all publications should be openly available to an open access journal or an open access platform or to an open access repository immediately. So without an embargo. And there have been a couple of funders who signed up to this plan who thought, okay, this is a great idea. Let's all put our shoulders under this. And the European Commission and ERC uh, both signed uh, this plan S. There are some other stipulations like authors should retain their copyright and uh, publications should be published under an open license. Open access publications fees are covered by the funder or the research institution. So these APCs I've been talking about should not be put under researchers. Uh, and fees must be transparent. So this is also an element that's uh, at, this, at this moment in time, not there yet. And there's no support for hybrid models. So the, the, the um, subscription-based journals who also offer to put one uh, article openly available, that's no longer supported. So as I said, uh, the EC signed scientist plan um, does it change anything at the moment? No. So it's, it's with effect from 2021. This um, is probably not a coincidence that, that it's uh, the same year as uh, the start of a new uh, research program, Horizon Europe. But at this moment, the program is still being negotiated, so we can't say anything about practical implementation, if this is going to be completely adopted and how. Um, we just don't know yet, so unfortunately I cannot tell you much about it, but at this moment uh, the policy is still as I explained uh, before starting to talk about Plan S here. Also like to quickly maybe um, answer some frequently asked questions and also some questions that have been submitted to the form. Uh, thank you for that. 
So what if there's no open access journal available in my domain? <clears throat> I hope I made it clear that you can choose whatever journal you want. So you're not limited to this open access journal. If there's not a journal available, you can still provide open access to a repository. What if the embargo period of the journal is longer than six months or 12 months for uh, social science? Well, this is a difficult one. Um, in some countries, there's an exception on the copyright law, which says that you can provide open access through a repository within the embargo period, even if it's otherwise stipulated in a contract by a publisher. So it overrides the contract of the publisher. So um, in Belgium and in um, France, the embargo periods that they say, like, okay, this embargo period is allowed, uh, allowed uh, corresponds with the uh, regulation of the EC, six to 12 months. In Germany and the Netherlands, where you also have this exception on copyright law, uh, it's, it's a little uh, more vague. So in Germany, it's 12 months and you cannot uh, do it for commercial reasons. Nobody can, can use it for commercial reasons. And in Netherlands, it's a within limited uh, limits of, of uh, limited scope, uh, limited time. So, um, but if you uh, do research in one of those countries, you might uh, say, okay, there's this exception on the copyright law and still allowed to put it openly available in a repository. But if it is not the case, um, you can ask your publisher for an amendment on your publishing agreement. And the EC to provide support for this, for compliance with Horizon 2020, has uh, offered a model amend to publishing agreement. Again, this is a link you can follow and you can ask your publisher uh, to sign it and ask for an um, um, exception. I've also heard people um, who published in a, a closed um, subscription-based journal buying open access um, later, so a hybrid uh, detour they did. Um, also a possibility might be expensive. Um, it's, a, it's a good thing to check your publisher's policy before publishing. Just a general good thing. There was one question. Other funders have negotiated agreements with publishers on embargo links, which are then available in funder-specific PDFs. Does Horizon 2020 have anything like this? Um, I couldn't find anything like this. So I, I don't think it exists. Um, maybe some of the other open air people saw something like that, but I uh, didn't, didn't find anything like this. Um, so if you have Tr trouble uh, with embargoes, I would um, refer back to the pre previous question. Are they sanctioned for not complying with open access requirements? Yes, so there's um, the general sanction of that your grant may be reduced. Um, this, does this happen? Yes, the EC does monitor if your publication is uh, openly available. Uh, I don't know if any grants have been reduced, but they suddenly have been asking why certain publications are not openly available. Not to scare you, um, it's just so you know, and um, there's no reason why you wouldn't uh, try to make your uh, article openly available to the world, right? So um, I hope you all now know a little bit more on how to do it. And I think we can, um, go for questions. I'll shop, stop sharing my screen so I hopefully can see some questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Emily. I think for the for the sake of keeping this a bit, <laughs> a bit clear, I will uh, first go through the questions asked in the Q&A, um, because a lot of them, I think, uh, can be answered quickly. Uh, okay. So, um, let me let me first go for the quick for the quickies. Okay. okay. <laughs> There's a question about gray literature. Uh, what is this? So um, somebody asked, like, is this monographs, books, conference proceedings? If I'm correct, but please say, uh, say if I'm not, uh, I think the official definition of gray literature is non-peer reviewed literature. And um, the, these policies here are only uh, applicable to peer reviewed uh, publications. So, um, I mean, of course, you're, you're, we, we would encourage you to deposit in repository any gray literature you, you might, your project might produce, but this is not subject to the, to the policies. Um, so then there was a question, and I think it was, I think it was a very good one <laughs> because somebody asked, can you repeat what gold and green open access means? Uh, because mm -hmm. sometimes we tend to be uh, 
like lose ourselves in jargon <laughs> jargon so uh, maybe for the sake of clarity emily you can just repeat yes um i don't know if i uh, use those terms actually um but by gold what's um usually meant is anything that's published in an open access journal so that's immediately openly available and green um is um so the other route uh, where you make your publication openly available to a repository so these okay. terms are often used um, yeah. in open access world. <laughs> so, so I think there's a tendency lately to just talk about open access publishing and open access and self archiving. But if you hear the terms, so this is what they mean. Um, they're not mutually exclusive. I think that's also important to stress so that you can you can publish in an open access journal and deposit in uh, in a repository. So that's not that's not an uh, not an issue and um, not all gold open access publishing is equal to article processing charges of author fees yes um, mm -hmm. yeah. so um then there is a question uh what are the preferred repositories to deposit your research in and uh, especially is our our services like ResearchGate acceptable mm -hmm. yeah that's a good one um so ResearchGate is not a repository <laughs> it's a commercial um initiative so um yeah it's it's research gate is not seen as a repository it doesn't have the services it doesn't have um the uh, sustainability of a repository so i know research gate is, is widely used and uh, definitely use it um as a promotional tool as a communication tool as everything you want but as an as a repository it does meet does not meet the criteria so it's good to look at an institutional repository if you work for a research institution or um, a disciplinary spe specific uh, repository. Um, does it that kind of yeah. answer your question? And if, yeah. if you really have trouble with finding a repository, Zenodo is a very good yes. answer because mm -hmm. it's a catch-all. And also, and I'm typing it in the chat, uh, if you need some local assistance, but I think Pedro will discuss this later. If you need some local assistance uh, on like finding a repository, the, uh, your local contact points of the of National Open Access Desk, you know what, from Open Air will also be able to help you out. So if you're struggling finding a repository, if you're not affiliated with an institution, um, you can also reach out to them and they will be able to help you. Um, so then there's another question, is APC the same as Gold Open Access because we paid up to 5,000 euros? Uh, so I think this has been discussed by Emily. Uh, not all open access publishing or gold open action access is um, requires author fees or article processing charges, but we do recognize that in some fields that is the case, like you don't have the journal that you might want to publish in has an article processing charge in. So um, it's, it's, it's a matter of like checking out your field, what is available. And if you cannot pay, if you don't have funding for the author fee, or APC, uh, we would recommend that you go uh, for uh, that you make your publication open access via self archiving. That's correct, right? So, um, ba -ba -ba. what about PubMed? I think this is, this is a question related back to the to the repositories, sir, to the to, to, uh, repositories. Yes, yes, PubMed is a a good repository. Yeah. You can use PubMed. Okay. So is it pub possible to publish in several repositories in parallel? So is it node and a thematic one? Uh, I think that's answered as well. That's possible. Yes, it's so. possible. You you probably um, get two identifiers for the same article, but I yeah. don't know. It's not a problem. Yes, you can use yeah. more than one if you want it. So a question in the chat. Is ORCID a repository? Um, answered by, by Ilaria in the chat. So uh, ORCID is an author identifying uh, uh, tool, it's not a repository, but it's used, of course, and a lot of repositories use um, use ORCID as a way of, of uh, in the metadata. Um, okay, so then let me check if I have if I have. Uh, um, then, yeah, I mean, uh, this question is not entirely clear. That was asked a bit a while ago. You request open access within six months. So for non-open access journals, we need to pay for gold open access, for gold access. Um, I think this refers to the to the hybrid journals, if I'm correct. Yes. So no, <laughs> yeah. no, absolutely not. Uh, so most publisher, if not all, uh, allow a form of self-archiving. 
So you, it, if you, so, okay, if you want to publish, if you want to provide open access to your article and you do not want to pay anything, right? That's what you want to do. You go for either an open access journal that does not charge any APCs, and there are definitely a lot of those journals, or you go for a subscription-based journal, in which case the library pays for a subscription, and you self-archive in a repository. Self-archiving is always free. Um, of course, then you have to see if there's an embargo and things like that. Um, so just if you, if you don't want to pay, go for self-archiving or for an open access journal that does not charge APCs. So open access does not have to be expensive. <laughs> Yeah, and if I can add something on this, uh, the directory of open access journals that you mentioned before as a source of uh, open access journals is now listing 30, 13,000 journals. Not all of them have uh, eight required authors to pay APCs, so you can definitely find something in there that might be useful for you. I'm sorry, I was muted. <laughs> then there was another question. Um, I, assume, I think this is an interesting one. I assume that is one of the authors of the paper that has to upload the paper into an open access platform. And I assume the, uh, it also means repository. Or could somebody else within an EU project can do this for the author? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, in my institution, it's almost never the researchers who upload their, their publication. Yeah. It's somebody from, the, from their... Um, yeah, from the research group or, or the sec secretary or something like that. Um, so maybe, um, what is maybe uh, good to mention here is that, um, so one of the, the, the authors can, can upload it. Um, and of course, publications might be uploaded more than once. If, if your institution has a repository and you upload it and another author uploads it, it's, it's, it's not a problem um, who uploads it. It just should, should be available uh, openly. And if you want to check that, you can use uh, Open Air. I, I keep giving little hints to <laughs> what Open Air can do for you. So uh, just a teaser. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> if you're not sure your publication is openly available yet, you can check open. Yeah. Okay. okay, so so one more about repositories, but I've already replied. Uh, can you please clarify the term self-archiving? Do you mean archiving in a, man a manuscript in an institutional repository? Yes, but it can also be a disciplinary repository or in a catch-all repository like Zenodo. So uh, that's answered as well. Um, if the emphasis of the Horizon 2020 policy is on peer-reviewed journal articles, does this mean that the potential sanctions only apply, apply to such authors? Oh, I, I don't have any uh, examples of that, but that's the policy, so I would think so, yes. Okay. Um, so the questions keep on coming, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep it a little bit. There is... Um, so I, I see that there keep on coming questions about, about repository, about, uh, about uh, depositing in a repository. Um, um, so maybe one thing that could be clarified is, is talk a little bit about author rights, but, but I'm not sure if, that's, if we can do that briefly because that's usually the subject of an, entirely, of an entire webinar. Um, Emily, do you want to take it on or uh, shall I? <laughs> Um, yeah, go, you can go on, Gwen. <laughs> yeah, it's just this, this um, if you're an author of an article and, and either what you do is either you keep, on the copy, you keep the copyright yourself as the author or you, deposit, you, you transfer the, um, the copyright to your publisher. In that case, I think, Emily, uh, you explained this in the slides, in your, one of your final slides, that you, can, you have to check the policy of your, your publisher when it comes to self-archiving. So usually they allow you to do an embargo, especially if you're backed up by a policy. So you just check with your publisher, like, okay, you have the copyright, but am I allowed to self-archive and display uh, the publication by a repository? Um, and if uh, usually they say yes, either immediately or um, after an embargo period. And as we said, the allowed embargo period are six or 12 months. If for some reason they, they're allowed embargo period is longer, you should check with the publisher and tell them that you are supported by, uh, by a policy and that you need, you need this embargo period to be shortened, which can be done by an amendment of the, 
of the publisher contract. Um, okay, so um, I'm just going to be, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, to go through it because I don't want to take up all the time. There is a question about open access leading to an increase in plagiarism. I think we should not cover this because I think this has been covered elsewhere. Um, but I think in very short the answer, it's not, it's not because your research is copyright protected that it's not susceptible for, for plagiarism because people will always be able to access it via, for example, their institutional, uh, institutional subscriptions. And, I, and, and as far as I know, there has not, not been any studies that have indicated that there is any increase of plagiarism um, when, uh, with an increase of, um, of uh, open access. Um, so um, ba, 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 ba. there is a question about uh, regulating agreements with uh, publishers and consortium agreements. Any practical tips about that? Um, so I don't know if any of the other spe of the speakers have suggestions or examples. So what is the question? Whether um, like these agreements with publishers should be re regulated in consortium agreements. I, I, I would refer to, to, to existing consortia, uh, the experience that is available there. Uh, it's the Monroe question. It is, a is it advisable to be regulated in a consortium agreement? Any practical tips about that? Okay, so let's let's keep that question um, open. Uh, um, we suggest that that uh, if we have any questions that we cannot answer now, we will publish them on the webinar page afterwards with a with a with an, uh, a full answer if that's okay. Um. <clears throat> Yes, I think, uh, did I miss any questions in the chat, Ilaria? Um, let me check because there was one that was also reposted in the, in the Q&A section. Um, let me see, I answered a few of them about the webinar itself. Uh, are there any special open air services concerning the H2020 data pilot? It's one. Uh, is there an open access journal with impact factor and without APC? Yeah, these are the two questions missing. Um, so the one about impact factor uh, without APC. Um, do you know by heart, Gwen? Um, ding, um, I'm sorry, can you repeat? Yeah, I know one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <obviously. laughs> so it's about in impact factors linked with APCs. Yeah, so just let me check the title, but um, I'll, I'll jump in later with the, question, with the answer to this question. But yeah, there's one journal published by uh, the Italian National Geophysics Institute that is an open access journal without any APC um, that has an impact factor. I'll find the title. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Shall I suggest that we go forward with, with the rest of the presentation? Uh, please feel free to send in your questions during the Q&A. Uh, like I said, we will be uh, monitoring and discussing them either at the end of the webinar or uh, afterwards uh, on the webinar page. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, shall I join my screen again? So thank you for um, for all the questions. Uh, that's really informative, and we'll try to uh, summarize them and uh, share them. Okay. So what I'm going to do is share my screen and talk about data in Horizon 2020. Let's yeah. Sorry, just a second, Emily. The the, the 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 journal I mentioned before is called Annals of Geophysics. Just for information. Okay, thank you, Laria. So, um, thank you all um, for those questions. Um, I will continue the webinar talking about uh, open data, open research data, and data management in Horizon 2020. If you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to um, put them in the chat or the Q&A session of this. Okay, let's start. 
So in Horizon 2020, there's an open research data pilot. And the aim of the data pilot is not unlike the one of the open access to publication. It's to improve and maximize access to research data, but also to improve the reuse of research data generated by Horizon 2020 project. Because if you talk to researchers, their data is really important to them, but as a research um, object, it's, it's often neglected. So, um, and as an important part of research, that's a bit of a shame. Um, and Horizon 2020 tries to uh, make a change in that. So the EC launched a pilot, um, the Open Research Data Pilot, which was limited for a while and then in 2017 became the default for all projects. So if your project started in 2017, uh, you will be automatically part of the Open Research Data before you should check your grant agreement. The aim is to foster open science, but also to avoid duplication of research and lots of resources, because if data is not available, everybody who does uh, an experiment um, has, has to start from zero, right? Uh, with all their measurements. There are two pillars uh, in this, this open research data pilot. One is data management planning, and the other is trying to uh, provide access to research data. And I really like to stress for a moment that these are two pillars. So data management planning is, um, is like the cake. So everybody who, who generates data can do data management planning. And open access to research data is like the cherry on the cake. So that is an, an, uh, recommended, uh, highly recommended. But, but um, you can still do data management even if you do not, uh, cannot make your data openly available. That, that can happen for various reasons. So you can have the cake without the cherry. Having the cherry without the cake is a little bit of a mess. Um, if you just drop your data somewhere without any explanation on what it is, um, that's not very useful. So keep in mind that those are the two uh, components of, of the pilot. Data management planning, which you can almost always do, and open access to research data. So what are the requirements of the Open Research Data Pilot? Well, first of all, you have to develop a data management plan, which is explains uh, what data you will generate and how you will handle it. Then you should deposit a data set in a research data repository with the necessary information to understand what your project is about and what the data is about and what you did to the data. If possible, provide open access to the research data. So make it available for everyone. So this data pilot is primarily about the data that is needed to validate results in scientific publications. But of course, if your data is very uh, useful or very special, you can also um, uh, include other, other data sets or, or your raw data, for example. You can then specify which data sets you will include in your data management plan. So DMP is data management plan. It's a long word. <laughs> Um, participation, I already mentioned this. Um, so it started as a limited pilot in 2014 and an extended pilot in 2017 where every project is part by default. Costs for data management, which can be storage costs, for example, if large volumes of data are fully eligible for funding. So you can think about it um, when you, when you um, make your proposal or your grant, um, and it's possible to opt out. So it's a flexible uh, pilot, and you can opt out at any stage, because of course your project might change, your data might change, you can opt out during application. If you already know, okay, I'm not gener gonna generate any data, for example, but also during the grant agreement preparation or after signing a grant agreement. Even if you opt out of the data pilot, you're still encouraged to develop a data management plan because as I said before, data management is uh, a cake that almost everybody can bake if you work with data. Um, just to write down, okay, this is the data I'm gonna generate and this is how we're going to handle it. Opting out, so you have to give a good reason um, for this opt-out. It can be exploitation of results, confidentiality or protection of personal data, but of course you can 
sharing data is only the part of data management, if you have no data or any other legitimate reasons. So during evaluation, uh, there's no negative impact. So whether or not you opt out of the data, manage, uh, data pilot is not an evaluation criteria. Of course, you have to give uh, a good reason for that. If you, um, and it is, it's highly recommended that if you're able to participate, to participate in this data pilot. Um, yes, the EC, um, uh, as, uh, as a sentence, um, to use uses as open as possible and as close as necessary for your data. So definitely, if you need to protect your data for some reason, please don't open it. But if it's possible, please do so, so everybody can uh, make use of it. I'm uh, hitting the same nail with the hammer. So. Um, participation in the open research data pilot does not mean that you have to open up all your data you can choose with data, which data sets are suitable and there's um, a variety in how you can open you can open it uh, which means you uh, your data can be freely used modified and shared for any purpose by anyone or you can close it put it on a embargo or make it unable to share but there's also a middle ground where you limit access to data um, for example only a subset of your data can be available or only certain types of users uh, can use of your data that's also an option so no that's it's not black and white there's also a grayscale there you can find all the information on the pilots in the guidelines that the EC wrote, the guidelines on fair data management in Horizon 2020. It has notes on the extinction of the pilot. It clarified the concept of fair. So I haven't mentioned fair yet, but the aim is to make your data fair. Um, this is, uh, stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, so it's, it's more than making your data open. It should be done in such a way that it's understandable and accessible. The guidelines also explain what a data management plan is, when it should be updated. Um, it notes what happens at proposal submission states, as explained the cost. And important, it provides a template for if you want to write a data management plan or if you have to, need, have to write a data management plan. Uh, exists exist of um, uh, some questions. Um, you do not have to use a template, but I would highly recommend it because it uh, includes everything and all the questions to make your data fair. So the aim is to make your data fair and fair is findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. So what is that about? Findable means that your data set can be found not only by humans or people who know your project, but also, for example, by Google, if, if you're looking for a certain data set. Accessible uh, means if there's any limitation on the use of your data. So um, that is, is uh, clear that people know how to use your data and, and where they can find it and they can open it. Um, also, both for humans and for, for machines. Interoperability has to do with can other people um, use your data and do they understand what your data is about? Um, so it has to do with using standard forms of metadata, standard forms of, of um, programs used to, to uh, process your data and such things like that. And reusability has to do with, um, is it clear what I can do if I, if I can find your data and I can download it and I can use it because it's, it's clear what you did to the data, am I allowed to? So basically what FAIR does, it's, it's, it's making this little present of your data set that you can give to somebody else and, and that you do not have to explain uh, everything. So if, if people can access your data and they, they uh, want to use your data set that they immediately know, okay, I can find it, um, I know what I can do with it, I can reuse it, and it's, it's, it's processed in such a way that I can use it together with my data or um, in, in my discipline, uh, because you have the same discipline and you use standards method, methods of, of handling this data. So this is what FAIR is in, in, in a nutshell. 
So what does this mean in practice? Um, well, so there are some steps you can do to comply with the data pilot. Uh, the first step is to write a data management plan. This is explained what you will do with your data. This should be updated. So the first version you have to, is it deliverable at six months? And then you should update it throughout your project because of course, data um, at the beginning of your projects, you do not know everything and, and it might change and your data sets might change. Then after you finished uh, your project, your research, uh, you should find a data repository or um, one big tip is find a data repository before you finish your project because it can really help you to make your data fine, fair. Uh, something that matches your data needs. So look for a disciplinary repository. Uh, you can also use Synodal. And step three is then uploading the data together with um, information that makes it, um, that made the data understandable. So this can be metadata, which can be re read by a computer, for example, what project, what type of data it is, and other tools. Think about uh, code books, for example. And when you upload data, um, always use uh, standards in your discipline. So a standard file format or an open file format and attach a license so people know what they can do with your, with your data. So step one is write a data management plan and the data management plan um, explains how you handle the data during and after the projects. Um, the DMP example of uh, the, the template of the European Commission has a lot of questions um, um, to make your data fair and how you will handle your data and how you will uh, archive your data. So I like uh, this little sentence, uh, the compilation of many small practices that make your data easier to understand, less likely to be lost and more likely to be usable during a project or 10 years later. Uh, a lot of data is lost, a lot of data cannot be used anymore or opened anymore or find anymore. Uh, and seeing how much effort it takes to, to gather all this data, that's, that's really a shame. And also during the project, you know, if you uh, cooperate with other people, it's really useful to think in advance, okay, how can other people work on the same uh, Excel sheet that I'm working on? What are we going to do with, with versioning? Um, and, and how can we share our work? So that's a data management plan. Um, if you start uh, writing a data management plan, um, it's, it's not a finished uh, document once you have the first version, it's, it's a living document. So we have an initial DMP, which is not deliverable within the first six months. Then you can update your DMP whenever significant changes rise in your data or in your policy, for example. If you suddenly uh, have personal data, that's, that changes how you will handle your data. And then you have a final DMP uh, at the time of final review, if you have all the information and uh, you can up your, uh, update your data management plan with the last uh, changes. What topics are covered? So I uh, mentioned the template for Horizon 2020 projects. FAIR is uh, the guiding framework. So um, the aim is to make your data as fair as possible. But the template will cover various subjects. So a summary of what your data is, how it relates to your problem, a project, and how to make your data fair. Information about cost, if there is cost or resources that you need, do you need uh, a data steward or do you need large volumes, uh, do you have large volumes for, for your data uh, for which you, you will need storage, for example. Information about data security, this is mainly about how you handle your data during your project. And then any ethical aspects, those are mostly already covered in Horizon 2020 project in, in ethical um, deliverables. So um, I want to uh, um, give some more information on, on, on the questions that are asked um, on how to make your data fair, because it, now I, I can imagine that it's, it sounds like a very abstract kind of, of thing, making your data fair. So if you look at the template of um, Horizon 2020 for data management plan, it will ask you all this question, which are uh, sometimes overlap a bit, because those uh, concepts are not exclusive. On findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. Findability is our questions like, how can people discover your data? 
um, how can people understand your data? Is it clear what your data is about? Uh, except, and it will um, ask you about metadata, about persistent identifiers, about naming conventions, keywords, about versioning, things like that. Accessibil accessibility will ask questions like where to find your data? Can people access your data when they find it? Um, so it has to do with software and documentation. Um, is it clear what tools you used? And about data repositories. So this is another repository like the literature repositories. There are also data repositories, kind of safe, sustainable archives for your data with services on top of it. Interoperability um, deals with how other people, if they can access and find your data, can use it in their own projects. So it has to do with standards in disciplines and vocabularies and methodologies. Reusability mainly has to do with licenses. So if you attach a license to your data, people do not have to get back to you and ask, I want to do this with, with your data, can I do it? A license will make that clear immediately, like you're, 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 um, you can do this and that with, with, with my data set. A good tool to use is DMP Online. Um, DMP Online has a lot of templates for data management plans. Uh, it also has a template for Horizon 2020 um, projects. So this tool helps you um, uh, go through the process of writing a data management plan. These are all the fe features in one slide. Uh, so it, it lists all the questions and then um, you can write down the entry of your answer uh, and you can get back to it later if something changed and then uh, right next to it is some guidance and guidance uh, it includes um, the information in, in the guidance from the European Commission. So you will have that information plus information from the DCC, which is Digital Creation Center. They know a lot about data and how to manage it. You can also work together on this data management plan, leave comments for collaborators. You can share and export it. Um, and so it's, it's a useful, useful tool uh, that's, that can help you guide. Step two is find the data repository. Um, how to select the data repository? Well, um, it's, it's recommended as a first step to look for a domain specific data repository because data repositories are not only archives, but they also build services on top of uh, their, their archiving function. So if you, if you have a domain specific data repository, the services built on top of the repository will be specific for your domain, so that's very useful. Um, why a data repository? Because it's sustainable and people will, will find it and it's, it's, it makes your data uh, uh, findable, not only uh, by Google, things like that. There are some institutions who might have a data repository, so you can also ask your institution. Um, there's an overview of data repositories on v3data.org. You can look by subject, uh, so, if you're looking for a subject domain specific data repository uh, and you do not know where to go, would you recommend checking out RT data? There are also general purpose op uh, open access repositories such as Zenodo, which I mentioned before. It also welcomes data from all disciplines. So R3 data is a good tool. Uh, it can give you information on general purpose repositories, domain specific repositories and institutional repositories. And um, if you look for a repository, it's, it's good to pay some attention. A repository can really, really help you if it's a good repository to make your data fair, to make writing a data management plan a lot easier because it can take on a lot of the, the questions and tasks that, that you're asked to do. So um, look for data repositories that matches your data needs. If you have large volumes, for example, uh, does it accept the format in which your data is available? Does it attach an access level? Can you attach a license, for example? Um, um, does it have a landing page? Does it have a persistent identifier? So this unique code attached to your data, this handler. Um, and are there any costs involved? These are all things that, that are very good to know in advance. Step three, deposit your data. So um, depositing your data is, is basically uploading the data sets or data sets uh, to a repository. Um, so what do you need to deposit? 
everything to find, uh, assess, understand, and reuse data. So somebody outside of your project who is looking for, for data on a, a specific uh, topic and you have those data should understand what your data is about. So first of all, of course, the data um, with relevant standards for interoperability, um, use common file formats, uh, a Photoshop picture um, in, a, in, in that kind of format it cannot be opened by a lot of people where a JPEG can, for example. <laughs> Together with metadata, um, so metadata is data about the data. What is your data about? What, who is the author? What's the language of your data? Um, things like that. Um, often a repository can also help you with metadata and there are different uh, metadata standards which you can use. Some are domain specific. So I'll put some, some links there uh, with information on metadata and metadata standards that can help you. And any, any other documentation. So this is a little packet. So the other documentation is a documentation that help people understand the data. This can be code books or a data set structure or notes, annotation, even a readme uh, file uh, can be very useful for people. Or software if you use, uh, if you wrote some code, for example, to, to handle your data. What about our project page? Isn't that the ideal um, place to store my data? Well, um, it's, uh, yeah, no, not, it's, it's really hard to, to do all, all the things that a repository can do for you yourself. So is it a sustainable way? Who, who will update the project page? What after the project or all legal aspects covered? Uh, can you put a license on your data on your project web? website? Is it findable? Um, so those are, are all things that project websites um, are, are, are not always the best place for. I, I put an example there. It's, it was last uh, updated in 2010. It has some data um, and if you want um, more information on the coding or things like that, you can contact the project leader. Um, imagine this data set would be really popular and you get uh, 120 uh, emails asking you what can I do with the data and, and where is the data and can I use the code and where is the code. Um, you want to avoid this um, and you can do that by uh, finding a, a research data repository. And then you can of course link uh, on your project site to the to, to repository where your data is, if you want to. So depositing your data, select an appropriate access level. So open if possible, but uh, a lot of repositories also um, allow you to have a restricted access. So where you can um, choose what kind of uh, restrictions your data uh, applies to. Or uh, if you want to put an embargo for, for some reason, um, if this is needed, um, also repositories can help you with that. So if you want to make your data open, if that's possible, please do. Uh, keep it simple, as open as possible. If you can make your data open, please do. If there are any um, second thoughts on that, um, if you work with personal data, with sensitive data, um, as close as necessary, keep that in mind. Apply an open license. Again, a repository can often help you with that. Um, which license to use? Well, the widest, um, the license for widest reuse possible. Uh, also keep in mind that, that facts are not, um, not copyrighted. So if you measure um, the amount of rain that falls every day, um, that's not automatically copyrighted um, because that's a, it's a fact. Um, so data repositories can provide licenses. R3 data indicates if the data repository can find a license. Some recommendations. If people come to me and they're like, okay, I, I need to write a data management plan and I do not know where to start. So keep in mind that this is a fairly new requirement. So it's normal to have a lot of questions when you first have to write a data management plan. Um, what I would recommend uh, is, is to, to look at repositories um, and to find a suitable repository uh, before the end of the project, because as R3 data um, indicates with their icons, um, repositories can make a big difference. So data management plan, the requirements of the EC will ask you, for example, um, 
what kind of uh, license will you apply and what kind of access uh, will they be on your data and will your data be uh, uniquely identifiable and those are all things that a repository can can help you with um, so it's good to to check out a repository check out r3 data see what the repository can offer you and it will already help you uh, along the way of of making your data fair and, and trying to write a data management plan. This is an example from Zenodo, um, where uh, I think it's a good example of uh, what to what to upload. So as as I said, so the idea is that people outside of your project, when they find your data, know immediately or know at least after investigating a little bit what your data is about and what you can do it, with it. So this is a, a README file, which makes the data understandable for humans. It lists all the things that are in this, this file and all the scripts. So it has metadata. So this is machine readable metadata. So this data set can also be found by Google or by other search engines or by other uh, means. It has scripts, which means it has the tools or together with the data in the same package to, to uh, process these data. And it has the data. It has the data in various file formats. So the TXT is an open file format and MRC. I looked it up, but it's a long time ago. Um, it's, it's standard file format. I think it was something, yeah. I, I, I'm not sure anymore. Um, Another thing that this repository, this is a nodo, can provide for you is a DOI. Oh, sorry. So this is um, a unique code which make your data uh, uniquely identifiable. Also something that will come back in data management planning. And as you can see here, uh, a, a license is attached to, to the data. So you do not have to go back to the author to ask what you can do with the, with the data. And of course, also here you can find, for example, keywords, um, which will help your data um, be findable. Um, so this is a good example of, of what it means to, to, to have your data um, uploaded in, in a fair way. So findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Examples of DMPs, um, often also one of the first questions I get uh, people trying to, for the first time, uh, trying to um, fill out the data management plan is, do you have some uh, examples? So Lieber has, has a working group on data management and they listed some DMPs which they reviewed. So they're not all Horizon 2020 examples, but some of them are. And then the Digital Creation Center also has a page with uh, examples of data management plan for various funders and for various disciplines. So if you're looking for examples, uh, you can always uh, take, a, take a look at those examples. So quickly, just to, to summarize, step one, write a data management plan. You can use an online tool for that. Um, you should update it at six months when something changed with your data at periodic evaluation and then in final review. Step two, find a repository that matches your data need. Don't wait too long with it. It can really also help you with writing a data management plan. For data repositories, look for a disciplinary one. It will be the best way, uh, the best um, way that 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 uh, repository can help you. It will um, apply to standards in your discipline. You can look at rtdata.org to look up data repositories if you don't know where to start. You can look, um, use Zenodo, which is a catch-all uh, repository for all disciplines, which will also provide you with uh, with good tools to make your data fair. Step three: deposit your data, so upload it in a repository. So, of course, the data, the data sets you want to uh, make available together with metadata and any other tools to understand the data. Make sure to use standard file formats, standard metadata schemas and attach a license, an open license, if that's possible. If you're looking for support, uh, look at the EC guidelines. Uh, open Air can help you. And I also find the website of the Digital Creation Center uh, in the UK very helpful for some of the questions. Thank you. Um, I, shall we do questions first or does Pedro want to tell something about open air? I was, 
I initially suggested to have the questions, the remaining questions at the end, but there are actually only three, and two of them have already been answered. So just okay. let me let me um, give an overview. So the, the first question that, that came up was, um, if you opt out during the grant preparation period, is there a possibility to change this back again afterwards? To which I answered that I assume that your project officer will not have a problem with that. Uh, unless somebody has proof of the contrary, I think they'll be very happy if you decide to to participate uh, uh, after all mm -hmm. and then do we do we expect to continue the the open research policy as mandatory practice in horizon europe i okay uh, i don't expect it to be i mean the data management plan part certainly um uh, will will be part of 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 um the next program, I think, and open, of course, but mandatory open will, will probably never be uh, um, required because it's, it's just not possible. There are people working with personal data, with biological sensitive data, with health data. So uh, to make the open parts of, of the data pilot um, mandatory will, will never happen because it's, it's um, yeah, just legally not not possible but uh research data management and and trying to make it open i i assume will will be part of the next uh, framework program as well so then uh, a question about could you give a concrete example of what your research group established data management facilities could be i think for example an example could be like a like a a, um, a tailor-made data management plan template for example so um so do you mean like or, um could you give a concrete of what your research group established data management facilities could be so do you mean like helping your group uh, managing data i i'm not sure if i understand the question fully Okay, but maybe we can we can wait for it. It's a shame I don't know your name. So um, we could um, maybe continue this discussion because I see now questions are coming, but we do want to have give Pedro the time to uh, present the open air mm -hmm. uh, project. So let's maybe shelve these questions until either after the webinar or uh, give them the same treatment as we will with, well, with the other remaining ones and provide you with an answer in writing uh, later this week. Is that okay? So. So um, Open Air uh, is the, the open science infrastructure for research in Europe is providing, of course, support for the implementation of the, the open access and open data um, uh, requirements in, from, from the European Commission in Horizon 2020. It's an infrastructure that uh, collects content from um, different um, repositories, journals, uh, um, publications, catalogs. So we have. Uh, uh, more than um, 15,000 journals uh, within our infrastructure, over uh, 1,200 uh, repositories. Uh, so, uh, gathering and collecting all this content, we can provide um, different types of services to support the requirements of the European Commission. And we have some other tools and also some help desk and training materials to, to help uh, project coordinators, researchers, different projects to comply with the EC requirements. I, I will try to highlight some of these services and, and tools really uh, quickly, uh, just for you to be aware of uh, how can Open Air help you uh, to comply with Horizon 2020 requirements, open access requirements. So services for open access depositing and also storing research data available through the, the, the infrastructure and specifically, for example, for research data in Zenodo. Some services uh, related with reporting uh, publications and research outputs and uh, also linking publications to projects or to uh, other research outputs and services for um, discover information for uh, uh, analyzing all the, the content that we have available in the infrastructure. So first of all, it's important for you to be aware that uh, the information uh, that Open Air is, co is collecting and linking to projects, to, to Horizon 2020 projects, is automatically available in the participant portal. 
So this is, uh, this is quite important. I will show later uh, the, the, the project landing pages that we have in our infrastructure, but it's important for you to be aware that uh, all the publications that we have listed as outputs from a project, they are available uh, in the participant portal for reporting purposes. But uh, in the other way, it's um, also important to, to clarify that uh, all the, um, the, the projects uh, FP7 in the past and now Horizon 2020 projects that we have in our infrastructure, they come directly from the systems from the European Commission, from CORDI system. So we have all the information from the Horizon 2020 in our infrastructure and we provide back information about publications and data to the participant portal from the European Commission. And this is something that is quite relevant for you to know uh, as the first uh, service that we, we provide you uh, indirectly because we provide the information for the European Commission. Now just to highlight the services that we have um, to share and deposit, to explore and to discover the content, to report and to link research uh, results. First is that via the, the Open Air portal, uh, specifically the service Explore, explore.openair.eu, you can uh, check uh, if your institutional repository uh, is uh, compliant with Open Air or if you have a thematic uh, repository um, appropriated for, for you to deposit publications and to share research data. And you can check that uh, directly in the, in the Open Air um, portal. Uh, the same for publications and for uh, research data. We have a list of content providers that you can check or if you uh, just search, search for, for the, um, your institution or the name of the repository, you will you will find it and check if it's compliant or not, or if you have any repository available in your specific domain. Uh, if you don't have an appropriate repository, as Emily said, so Open Air have available Zenodo repository where you can um, upload, uh, describe, and publish uh, publications, uh, different kinds of literature, scientific literature, but also uh, research data and other kinds of research output. Uh, like uh, software, um, images, uh, protocols, etc. So you can use the node to deposit uh, the results of your project. It's a catch-all repository available for you with a limit of upload uh, of 50 gigabytes per data set and all the other features that uh, Emily already uh, highlighted for you. Um, related with the discovery service, so this part was the first part was related with uh, how you can deposit or find a repository to deposit but as we collect all this content we have we have a service available for you also to check all the the information that we have but it's important to highlight that we are not talking only about um, publications or data sets we are also talking about all the, the the other information that we collect from the list of projects from different funders as we have projects and we have partners in projects, we have also organizations and we have different kinds of research outputs. We don't have only research data and publications, but we have already records, software records, uh, other kinds of research products like um, images, uh, web applications, web services, uh, protocols that are also um, gathered in this infrastructure. So explore.openair.eu is a service where you is our discovery service where you can find for all these different kinds of um, information to explore the content and also to link is where the main services for project coordinators and for researchers are available uh, where we can you can find where to deposit where you can find also the way to link different kinds of research outputs and uh, one of the most important outputs from the fact that we gather all this content in our infrastructure is that, that we can provide uh, really concrete services for projects. So for each project, um, we can provide uh, reports, a uh, list, list of publications, some statistics, and um, we can provide also, and we have also a landing page where the, the project coordinator and the researchers can find all their outputs together. So here you have some screenshots from different types of landing pages that we have in our infrastructure. 
uh, we have a landing page for a project where we uh, gather all the publications, research data software, etc., and we put some numbers of publications. Uh, we have uh, the organization's page, each organization that is part of a project or it's, is, is a provider of open air have a landing page and we identify all the projects that um, at least all the projects from the European Commission that are um, that that institution specifically is um, part of and, uh, and, and of course for uh, for um, data sets and publications we also have landing page with the metadata the descriptive metadata and the links to where you can download the, the publications and access the, the publications. Uh, I just want to highlight that uh, regarding the project's um, landing page, uh, uh, we have um, an application toolbox uh, with some uh, interesting uh, features. So you can, for example, get a report of all publications, uh, get a report in CSV or in HTML, uh, so that can you can easily create um, generate a list of publications you can embed uh, those uh, th that list in uh, a website in a personal or a project website so quite interesting um, uh, applications that you can uh, use uh, reusing the the fact that we are gathering the, the content uh, but uh, it's of course uh, then it's important to highlight that uh, so we are linking also the publications to the EC participant portal. So the publications that are available in this uh, project landing page, for example, for this project, uh, 187 publications, they will be available in the participant portal for uh, reporting purposes. And then uh, uh, to finalize this part, an additional, uh, an interesting uh, feature is uh, quite useful for project coordinators is uh, um, uh, functionality to link uh, publications to projects or to link uh, different kinds of research outputs. Something that uh, we received uh, from, as a feedback from users, so lots of project coordinators have as asked us to develop this kind of feature, so how can they easily link, identify that a specific publication is an output from a project if they are not able to do that via a repository or via a different uh, content provider, at least they can do that uh, easily in, in open air. So the link research results tool is a, a, a functionality where the, the researcher or a project coordinator can identify a publication and then uh, say uh, to the infrastructure to open air that this publication is an output from a specific Project. So you just need to select the project, select the, the, the publications, and then review the metadata, identify if it's an open access, closed or embargoed publication, and then just create this link. And automatically this link will be also visible in the project landing page um, and also uh, report to the participant portal. So each user can manage all the links that the uh, uh, they are creating in a specific uh, list of uh, links, uh, delete or, or, or claim another one. Uh, but uh, it's also uh, uh, it's also important for you to know that uh, you can use this functionality directly in the link tool functionality, or uh, this functionality is available also uh, in the specific publications, research data, software records, metadata landing pages. So if you visit, for example, this example that we have here in the, in the, in the screen, so we have a, a record um, uh, uh, of a data set and you can create uh, a link uh, to a publication or a link to a, a project using the, the, the linking tool uh, functionality. So this is quite useful for, uh, for example, last minute reporting when the project coordinator realized that they don't have all the list of publications available in their landing page and available in the participant portal. And then can, they can easily come to the open air portal and claim their publications. So these are the main tools that uh, we want to highlight um, regarding the, the open air infrastructure. But I just want to, uh, to conclude that uh, to, to share 
uh, that we have an open science help desk service where you can find different guides, different fact sheets about um, open science and of course about Horizon 2020 open access and open data requirements. We have uh, an, an relevant uh, list of FAQs that you can use. And of course, we have this kind of webinars also where we can, where we want to provide support, and you will find also in the help desk of Open Air the recordings of uh, this webinar and in previous webinars. And um, in, within this help desk uh, service that we provide, we have also a human uh, help desk. So we have people in each country that can help you. So you can contact them. So in in Open Air. Um, in open air uh, portal you can find the list of no ads uh, and uh, the national open access desks can provide you support you just need to contact them via email phone or using our help desk system and um, have their support to explain you specific things about uh, the requirements from the european, european commission or other uh, national um, services and infrastructure that you have available to comply with the, the mandate. So this is um, all I want to highlight from the, the services and the type of support that we have in Open Air to, to help you uh, on complying with the Horizon 2020 Open Access mandate. Of course, we have much more to tell you about Open Air because it's a, a big and uh, complex infrastructure, but this is a, the, the main um, elements that I, I, will, I would like to highlight. Okay. Thank you very much, Pedro.